just a little bit of housekeeping before we dive in. Uh, you have this bulletin insert in your bulletin. Um, please pay attention to that if you would, please. We've been going through a Disciple Makers Handbook for several weeks. There's been quite a few groups. Is there anybody in here who's gone through the Disciple Makers Handbook in a, in a course? Okay, so that is another cycle that's happening again. So, um, let's see, Sherry, my wife, and Michelle from the office will be leading. Uh, Michelle's leading a Monday night, which starts on the 10th, and then Sherry for Women will start uh, on the 12th, that Wednesday night, and then men's. Larry, you're starting Wednesday the 12th, correct? Yes. Sign up is out at the Welcome Center. The reason this is important is the whole series that we've been going through over the past five weeks, of which I missed three, because I'll explain that later. We were taking care of my sister. But um, <clears throat> there's a pathway to equipping us and giving us the tools that we need to do uh, the things that God has given us to do and, and to have a toolbox that's full and keeping, continually adding things uh, in order that we might fulfill the mission of Christ. If you've been through the Disciple Makers Handbook before already now, um, when, this Wednesday at 6 p.m., uh, Ken, I believe, is leading this, if I'm, is this Ken, right? Ken is leading a three-week series on a micro-group leadership training. And so it's the, those of you who have been through the Disciple Makers Handbook already, um, Wednesday night in the Pine Room, 6 p.m., and that'll just give us more, more tools for the toolbox for leading different groups. And then after that, there'll be another uh, a coaching and training session that's, that's in a time to come to be announced. These are important things and important times. And we've been talking about the power of God and the gospel and, and prayer and all these things. And I was given the spirit. I called Ken a couple weeks ago and said, Ken, here's the problem. I, you're giving me 40 minutes to preach on the power of the spirit and disciple making and it's a three month series. <laughs> And he said, it's 68 degrees here. Go ahead, I'll stay. <laughs> and uh, so, Matt, you're up next week. Um, no, he'll be back. But uh, just a, a brief introduction for those of you who don't know me. I, I was a youth pastor here for a few years and um, then went on to a senior pastorate down in Faribault. And um, as God would have it, we closed that church. And... Um, I was left with wondering what I would be doing. I, th I was thinking about the last 30 years or so, and I managed restaurants for a while, sold insurance for a while, was not good at it. Um, and then I pastored for 17 years, and then uh, all at once I wasn't doing that anymore, and it's kind of weird. So now every day I work from home, and this is what I say about 100 times a day. Hi, my name is Phil. I am a debt collector with State Collection Service. This is an attempt to collect a debt, and any information obtained to be used for that purpose. Now, I always thought telling a group of people that I was a pastor shut down a conversation pretty quick. Try being a debt collector. <laughs> <laughs> Even here, I've had a few oh when they walk away. <laughs> but that's what I do now, and um, what's important about that for me, a couple months ago, I came and talked to Ken, and I said, you know, Ken, I've realized that one thing's true. My job is a means to an end, but it gives me no satisfaction. If it weren't for the mission of Christ, I would have no purpose on this earth. And I think when we get to that place where we look at where the leadership here is trying to take us, and we understand that there is a mission that Jesus has given us, and it's not just a nice message to nod our head at, but it's a message to embrace and then act on. And we get to a place where the mission of Christ becomes our purpose and our job is just a means to an end. And that end is to provide for our family and we even have to trust God in that. These are the things that the leadership here has been leading us to. I've been a part of the men's ministry, I don't know how long, six months maybe, Larry? And it's been a pleasure to do that. I've really enjoyed it and I can't encourage you enough to, to dive in. This morning, we're going to look at the Holy Spirit disciple making. And he's often considered a forgotten person of the Trinity. We don't talk about him much. We're Norwegian and Swedish, and we just don't talk about the Holy Spirit. And 
I think we have to stop having that attitude and we have to look at it and look at him and say, who are you and what is it that you do and how am I supposed to respond to you? And that's hopefully what we're going to do this morning. And again, it's kind of that 10,000 foot view. We're in no way going to cover everything in detail. Let's pray as we begin. Father, there is... Um, a group of people in this room that are coming from all kinds of places this morning. Maybe tragedy, maybe confusion, maybe arguments, maybe complete peace. You know where every heart is. And I pray by your spirit that you minister to each one in their place, in their time. And you would take this word and take the truth from it and not just make it real, but make it matter and be acted on. And the stuff that is just from my flesh, I, I pray that we'd forget that, that it wouldn't be remembered. And I just ask your blessing on this time. In Jesus' name, amen. So we need to talk this morning about who is the Holy Spirit. Some of this might feel a little bit academic. It's kind of the nature of, of the beast when you're trying to cover these things in a series. I, I normally am not a topical preacher. Uh, when I was preaching, I took three and a half years to go through Matthew, and um, that's just the way I do it. And so this is kind of challenging for me this morning, the things that I had to think about. And I was very fortunate that I had six weeks to think about it. And hopefully at the end of it, you won't say he had six weeks. Couldn't he have done better than that? But who is the Holy Spirit? It's referred to as a third person of the Godhead. The first thing we need to remember is the Holy Spirit is God. He's not, he's not just an extra. He is part of the Godhead. Just as the Father is, just as the Son is, the Holy Spirit is God. While the Trinity is a mind bender, having the proper view of who God is and our understanding of the Trinity, the best that we can, I believe, is essential as disciple makers. So we're going to dive into that just a little bit. Matthew 3, 13 through 17. Jesus arrived from Galilee at Jordan, coming to John to baptize him, be baptized by him. And John tried to prevent him, saying, I have need of being baptized by you, and you come to me? And Jesus answered him and said, Permit it at this time, for in this way it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. And he permitted him. And after being baptized, Jesus went up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened, and he saw the Son of God descending as a dove, coming upon him. Behold, a voice from the heavens saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I'm well pleased. We have all three persons of the Godhead in this portion of Scripture. First the Spirit, then the Father, and then the Son. We need to know that the Holy Spirit is God, and God is three persons. Again, a lot of this may not be new for you, but it's important foundation for where we're going. Next, each person of the Trinity is fully God. Acts 5 speaks specifically about the Holy Spirit being fully God. Again, not a sidelight, even though we tend to not talk about him. Starting at verse 3, Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit? And to keep back some of the price of land. While it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? And after it was sold, was it not under your control? Why is it that you have conceived this deed in your heart? You did not lie to men, but you lied to God. The Holy Spirit, like the Father, like the Son, is fully and completely God. Next, Mark 12, 29. There are not three gods, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. There's one God, three persons. And again, when we try to understand this, I believe this, if you can understand completely the Trinity, then your view of the Trinity is too small. If our view of God is simply understood, then our God is too simple. Jesus answered, said, the foremost is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one. There is one God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, three persons, one God. Consider this from the Athanasian Creed. 
We worship one God and three persons, three persons and one God, without confusing the persons, nor dividing the divine being. For the Father is one person, the Son another, and the Holy Spirit still another. But there is one God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, equal in glory and eternal in majesty. There have been many mistaken illustrations over the years, comparing them to the sun with heat, and comparing them to eggs, and comparing them to apples, and comparing them to four-leaf clovers, or three-leaf clovers, or whatever. In my opinion, they're all bad, okay? None of them come close to comparing what we need to understand. One God, three persons, all equal in glory and majesty. So what does the Holy Spirit do? This is where it starts to, oh, sorry, I didn't realize I didn't advance that. <laughs> you gotta yell at me, there's nobody back there now to tell me. <clears throat> we have to understand what the Holy Spirit does because this is the part where we engage. This is where we want to understand how am I as a believer in Christ, how am I as a follower of Jesus, one who's been redeemed, and wanting to be a disciple maker of others, understand the work and role of the Holy Spirit, not only in my life, but in my training of another. Number one, know this reality, the Holy Spirit dwells within the believer. 1 Corinthians 3.16, do you not know that you are the temple of God and the Spirit of God dwells in you? One of many verses that we see this. What does this mean for the disciple maker? That the Spirit of God dwells in you. I, I need to step back for a second. We need to talk about who is the redeemed person? Who is the person who is the believer? Who is the person who is the follower of Christ? I've noticed in Scripture that there is never once a moment where Jesus is referred to as Savior and Lord. He is always referred to in the order of Lord and Savior, and that matters. In order to be a saved person, you must first surrender your lordship for his. Then he becomes your savior. And in that comes the receiving of the Holy Spirit, the one who dwells in you. What does it mean for us? One, we're not alone. We don't, we don't accomplish the mission of God on our own. Matter of fact, we can't, we can't accomplish it at all apart from Christ. We can't accomplish it at all on our own power. We have the spirit of the living God with us and within us. And this is the part that really helps me walk in the reality of who he is and give me confidence when I have no confidence in myself. The same power that said, let there be and there was in the beginning that created this world. The same power that raised Lazarus from the dead. The same power that raised Jesus from the dead is in us. Let that sink in. We can say that the Holy Spirit is dwelling in us and that's okay. No, stop. Let it sink in. The same power and reality of who God is is in you. The scriptures say that he dwells in you. Now it's important for us to not confuse the indwelling of the Holy Spirit with being filled with the Spirit, which are different things as we read in Ephesians 5. The result of being filled in the Spirit, I believe, comes from a continual obedience to the Spirit. If we are, as Steve preached about abiding in Christ, our obedience is not to prove that we're abiding in Christ. Our obedience is a byproduct of abiding in Christ. And as we abide and as we yield to the power and the guidance of the Holy Spirit, we're giving him control, and there are moments when God can, by his choosing, fill the believer with his spirit for a particular purpose in the kingdom. The believer is always indwelt. We never lose the indwelling as a believer, but the filling is a moment in time that God chooses for his purposes. Don't confuse those. So the purpose of the indwelling in the believer is this, to guide, instruct, and empower the believer for what? Godly living and godly service. Understand there's nothing good in us, right? Our only righteousness is Christ himself. We can't do good, we can't be good apart from him. He is the one by his, in giving us his spirit, he is the one who guides us, instructs us, and empowers us for godly living. We understand that the Holy Spirit does this, and it does some things for us. It creates two realities for us. And it's for two different groups of people, and I want you to understand both of them are pretty much the same except the ending. Here we go. Number one, 
if you are a person who is sitting here today saying, I have nothing within me, I am not worthy, I don't have the ability, I don't have the tools, I can't do this. I can't be a disciple maker. I'm good with coming to church. I'm good with doing my thing and having my friendships and stuff like that, but I just can't do that. I want to remind you of the first chapter of Matthew and the list of people who are in the line of Christ. Okay, at the sake of whatever might happen to me, there's a lot of messed up people in that list. And I feel like I'm in good company. I, I don't have it within me to do it on my own. Matter of fact, when I look at my own sin, I don't think sometimes I should even be up here. You answer the call of God. Whatever that is in that moment, what are you being asked to do by him? Are you listening to the spirit of God and moving in the reality of that? Here it is. You can let go of any notion that you have to have it together enough to be a disciple maker. Beloved, you are not accomplishing anything in your own life or in the life of the disciple anyway. Can you hear that? It's God who's doing it, and specifically it's the Spirit. So what does this mean for us? We're without excuse, right? Moses, he couldn't speak. God said, I got it covered. Make any excuse you want. You have the power of the living God dwelling within you, and it's not you who does the transforming in the disciple anyway. It's the Spirit. Secondly, hear this. You can let go of any notion that you are also, if you are thinking this, God's gift to disciple making. You're not that cool. <laughs> it's not you. It's not you accomplishing anything in the life of the disciple. It's the Spirit of God. So it brings several things, confidence and humility at the same time. It's the Spirit doing the work. Furthermore, again, any good and godly thing that is in us is from the Spirit of God. It's not by the will of man. It is the Spirit who guides, instructs, and empowers us for godly living and service. And again, don't let this truth pass you by. This is key to teaching and discipling and making disciples who are disciple makers. The disciple needs to know and understand that they need to follow Jesus and not follow you. Now Paul wrote this in 1 Corinthians 11.1, 1, be imitators of me just as I am imitators of Christ. The idea behind this is this. Wherever I'm following Christ, follow me in that. Where I'm not, don't follow me. Matter of fact, hold me accountable in those areas. Wherever you see Christ working in me and growth in me and obedience in me, imitate that. Where you see me pulling those things back, don't imitate that. Call me on it. In other words, train people to follow you as you follow Jesus, but in the areas you are struggling with Jesus, be honest with your disciples and caution them. And that's the hard part, isn't it? Vulnerability. It's a hard part for us to take an honest look at ourselves and say, this is the area where I struggle. But there's nothing more freeing than not trying to hide that anymore. Also, let your disciples point out your blind spots. I believe humility goes a long way in the disciple-making process. They need to esteem Jesus and not you. They need to imitate Jesus and not you. They need to reflect Jesus and not you. But they can see you doing those things. And in there, imitate you. And I believe the way to accomplishing this is yielding to the Holy Spirit as he guides, instructs, and empowers. You know, those of us who are in Christ, we know when God's saying something to us and how often do we ignore it? How often are we like Jonah trying to escape Nineveh, running away. Disciple makers hear this, always point people to Jesus who is pointing us to the Father. That's our job. That's our mission. Now the Holy Spirit also dispenses gifts of the Spirit to believers in both 
disciples and disciple makers alike. We, we benefit from these things. And I understand that there are different views on the gift of the Spirit. I want to talk about that just a little bit. Some who attend here are, are cessationists. That is, they believe that the gifts of the Holy Spirit, some of them, the sign gifts, are not for today. And people who aren't cessationists believe that they are. There's really two groups of people there. And these gifts are namely miracles, healing, tongues, interpretations of tongues, prophecy. In interest of full disclosure, I am a cessationist. I am, I'm sorry, I'm not a cessationist. I believe in the full operation of the gifts of the Holy Spirit for today, all of them, as God chooses when he chooses. I will not speak for Ken. I will not speak for Steve or the elders. I don't know, frankly. I haven't asked them. But I want to tell you this. As I believe the gifts of the Spirit are for today in the church in any way he wills and sees fit, I don't think it's a deal breaker if you disagree with me. This is not an area to break fellowship. The center of this argument is found in 1 Corinthians 13, 8 through 10. Love never fails, but there are gifts of prophecy and they will go, they'll go away and there are gifts of tongues and they will cease and there's gifts of knowledge and that will be done away with. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. When the perfect comes, the partial will be done away with. Now the cessationist says this, the perfect coming is the completion of the canon of scripture and once we had the complete word of God, that was it and those gifts are no longer for today. And some might even say that it's part of the um, ministry of the apostles, capital A, in the, in that we read in the book of Acts and when that was done and the church was born, there, there were no more. However, uh, I, I don't believe that. I believe that the perfect coming is the second coming of Christ when there is no more sin, when the church is gathered. Now, again, I don't view this difference in doctrine and belief to be an area that is a deal breaker for us. I believe we can love one another. I want you to know that if you are a cessationist, while I think you're wrong, I love you, and I'm sure you think I'm wrong, and I hope you love me too. It's okay. I'm back to the topic at hand, the key area. And our dependence on the Holy Spirit is to yield to him, not only in obedience and response to him and his promptings and his conviction and those things, but also in the dispensing of these gifts. We read this in 1 Corinthians 12, 7, but to each one is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. The gifts of the Holy Spirit were given to believers for the body for our common good, in our mission. Guard against any misconception where these gifts come from. The disciple maker cannot manufacture them on their own, although we see people doing that all the time in churches today. One of my pet peeves. We gotta guard against the misconceptions of where these gifts come from. It is God and God alone who dispenses this, these gifts by his spirit to whom and through whom he chooses. And the gifts are not a source of any sense of pride. If, if you're somehow a recipient of any of the gifts of the Holy Spirit and you see that working and you become prideful, please be cautious. That's a bad place to be. They don't come from us. They're not accomplished by us. They are a gift of God given for the purpose of building up the church. As a disciple... We can both be the recipient and the agent of these gifts. And it is good to desire that God would use us in any way he sees fit. So what are these gifts? Here's a quick list. We have words of wisdom, knowledge, faith, healing, miracles, prophecy, distinguishing spirits, tongues, interpretation of tongues, service, teaching, exhortation, giving, leadership, and mercy. The gifts have been, I believe, our being and will continue to be dispensed by God through his people by the filling of the Holy Spirit in his timing to whom and through whom he wants for his purposes. Subsequently, the disciple maker cannot only use these gifts given by God, but he can also train up the disciple to yield to the Holy Spirit in obedience to God and train him up in these gifts. Now, how do you do that? And I've ran across churches who say, okay, this month, we're going to teach you how to do X, and they pick one of the gifts. I want to caution you against that. I think 
The way we train someone up is walking in the reality of them, and this is what I mean by that. Uh, when we went to Zambia in 2011, uh, we were on the plane. If you ever get a chance to fly Ethiopian Air and you are the group leader, um, it's a great airline to fly with because they automatically bump the group leader to first class. It was awesome. <laughs> Believe it or not, we landed in Ethiopia and we had a connecting flight to Lusaka, Zambia. And we get there and my back seized. The boys had to carry my bags for me. We get to the place where we're staying in Lusaka. I'm in all kinds of pain. We go to bed, it's about two in the morning, and I have to get up and use the facility and I can't walk. I walk bent over and the pain is increasing and it's just beyond anything I've ever felt before in my life. And Tom Ravensburg now lives in Idaho, no longer here, but he was one of the leaders uh, at the time in our church and, uh, for, for this trip. And he began to pray over me. And by nine o'clock in the morning, my back had loosened. I stood up straight, I felt no pain. And I haven't ever since thought in that way. God healed me. How was I discipled in that? I received the gift, I was a recipient, Tom was an agent. God was the power and I was healed. If you don't believe God heals, I'm sorry, he does. I was looking at Ty in the back of the room during the first service and the times that I know our family prayed for him and for several of you who did as well and understand that just, what, 22 days before that, my sister, was, I, I told her she had a transmission flush, really. <laughs> she was bleeding to death internally, and they gave her 32 liters of blood. If you're in the medical field, you know that's bad. It's like replacing her blood, I think, six times. And we prayed, and she's alive. She's with us. I know that there are those of us who have watch people die and we wonder why is it that God didn't heal them and I honestly am going to stand before you this morning and say I don't know. I don't understand God's economy in that. I don't know why he heals some and not others. I don't know. But I know he heals. Greg Lonzo in the first service was reminding me of a story I told several years ago in this area and um, I, mean, I don't know if you're familiar with Camp Shamanah kind of down in that Motley area. It's one of the E-Free Church camps. And the director, Herb, there went to China. The Chinese officials had come and they visited the camp. And they were interested in having a camp like Shamana in China, which is really weird because they're, you know, mostly underground church and whatnot at that time. And they were having a conversation where they brought Herb and his wife over to China. Now, Herb is a cessationist. So I think this is funny. <laughs> um, they're having a conversation at the table and he and his wife say something to the Chinese official and the interpreter begins to interpret it and the Chinese guy answers back and Herb is confused. And he says, why? And he told the interpreter to stop. And he said, when did you learn Chinese? <laughs> well, he didn't. They spoke it in English, he heard it in Chinese. Chinese guy talks back, they hear it in English. That's tongues. I don't get why we don't see it more. That's God's deal. I'm just saying, if we're going to use the gifts of the Spirit in the area of disciple making, we have to be open to it. And that's hard for us who grow up in a culture that are stoic. I get it. We don't talk about the Holy Spirit. We don't, we don't work in those arenas. It's time we start. Trying to make a disciple who will be a disciple maker without training a person in the way of the Holy Spirit, I believe is setting them up for failure. It's kind of like this. 
and I'm not a carpenter or a builder or a contractor, but it, this sort of makes sense to me. If this illustration falls through, Kevin will fix it later. <laughs> okay? Here's the deal. If I, as a general contractor, go to my team and say, okay, go build this house, but I'm not going to give them blueprints and I'm not going to give them wood or nails or screws or screw guns and hammers and measuring tapes and the things that they need to complete the job, then I have set them up to fail. If we are going to be disciple makers and be effective disciple makers, we must be open to the realities of the gift of the Holy Spirit and be willing to walk in them and be willing to teach them. Even if we don't understand, I don't understand a lot of things about the gifts of the Holy Spirit. But I know this, I've been a recipient. That same trip in, in, in uh, Zambia, I want to tell you the story really quick. Two days later, no, we were there two weeks, so it would have been seven days later. We were on a trip down towards uh, Victoria Falls and we stopped off in this village and our bus driver, I had symptoms of malaria. And um, I'm sitting here going, well, God healed me. Can we pray for you? <laughs> sure. So Tom and I, we lay hands on him and we pray for him and we go to bed. The next morning, here's the miracle that happened, you guys. The next morning, he's got a huge smile on his face. He said, do you feel better? He goes, yeah, but that's not a big deal. We're like, he had malaria yesterday, it's kind of a big deal. He said, I met Jesus last night. You see, any sign, any miracle, any manifestation of the Spirit is meant for one purpose, and we're told this, that they might know that Jesus is who he says he is, the Son of the living God. We need to walk in him. We need to be open to him. It would surprise me if you hadn't heard by now about the Disciple Makers Handbook. Harrington and Patrick, they wrote above the Holy Spirit and they, they said these things. He, he draws us to follow Jesus. He changes us to reflect an image of Jesus and he powers our partnership with his mission. What's important to note here is that we must accept our role in the disciple making process. Each one of us, whether we are the disciple, disciple maker, we have to accept our role. They went on to talk about these roles. The disciple's role is to, in submission to God, embrace what the disciple maker is teaching. So we have to be teachable. If we're not teachable, we can't be disciples. It's that simple. I don't care what it is. None of you in your job are going to try and train somebody in who refuses to learn and to listen. The disciple maker's role is to intentionally pursue, encourage, and teach and coach and pray for the disciple. Understand, this is more involved. There, there has to be this conscious, intentional effort as a disciple maker to say, I am going to love you with the love of Christ in that. That means my time, it means my emotion, it means my care, it means everything that I can give in order to help you walk with Jesus. Now here's the important part, it's God's role. By his spirit, God transforms a disciple bearing fruit in the disciple and the disciple maker. And it's really important for us again to remember it's not us, right? It isn't from us that we are the ones doing the transforming, that we are the ones producing the fruit in the disciple. It is the spirit. We're not the power behind the transformation process. And we have to note this too. It's not the fruit of Phil or Bob or Jane. It's the fruit of the Spirit. Don't ever get caught up in your own goodness. Because our goodness is filthy rags without Jesus. Author Craig Etheridge put it this way. The Holy Spirit is the one who causes spiritual growth to happen. Without him, you can't take someone... Grow, you can't make someone grow any more than a farmer makes a crop grow. Spiritual maturity is a divine work of God and a miracle to watch. Once a person is a believer in Christ, 
We also need to understand this as disciple makers. The Spirit's work isn't over just because of regeneration. It's actually just begun. Oftentimes we believe that salvation is like an end, something we check off our list. And it's not. Salvation is the beginning. It's the beginning of our life as believers. It's the beginning of our life in surrender to the Lordship of Christ. It's the beginning of our life in listening to the guidance and instruction of the Spirit. We ought not neglect the Holy Spirit. We also ought not take credit for what he's doing. We don't have time to talk about the fruits of the Spirit today. I encourage you to read Galatians 5 if you're not familiar with them. It's a fascinating study. I just want to say this about the fruits. If we're abiding in Christ, if we're walking by the Spirit, these fruits, love, joy, peace, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control, will mark our lives. Do you want a test of whether or not you're indwelt by the Holy Spirit? It is not evidenced by you speaking in tongues. It is evidenced by the fruits of the Spirit in your life. While, again, there's much more to say about that. There's just a couple more things, and we'll get this wrapped up. <clears throat> Jeff Vanderstelt, you may or may not be familiar with him, pastor out on the West Coast. He launched a training series in the Gospel of John, and he started in chapter 20 and verse 21, which reads like this, Therefore, Jesus therefore said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I send you. And then he went to chapter 1, verse 1, and began to teach in John. Later, he decided, after much study, that he really messed that up, that he made a mistake. And here's what he said. He said, I never read verse 22. Let's read verse 22 of chapter 20. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. He went on to say this, that he had missed the point, and he explained that if our understanding is that we need to be Jesus to others, after several months of trying, here's what's going to happen. We're going to burn out and we're going to quit. And catch this. This is what he said. Jesus never intended you to be Jesus. There's only one Jesus, and you don't need to be him. He's the only perfect one. And while Jeff said it a different way, Jesus never asked or commanded us to be him. Again, he is the only one. The disciple is not to look at you as the disciple maker, right? And see Jesus and in some way confuse you with Jesus. Why? Because if his focus is on me, if I'm the disciple maker, if his focus is on me, here's the thing. I sin. I'm going to mess up. I'm going to do things where I'm not abiding. I'm going to do things that may lead that person in the wrong direction. Not on purpose, not with pride, not with any sense of Oh, well, no, with deep conviction and deep remorse. What Vanderstel said was this. It was a mistake to think that the world could see Jesus at work in us without understanding the presence, power, and work of the Holy Spirit. You see, the Holy Spirit, his life, his ministry, his encouragement, his guidance, his power, his instruction, his gifts, his fruits, all of that allows the world to see Jesus at work in our lives. We are to be reflectors of Jesus, yes. Jesus is the one who's perfect. And this isn't an excuse in our sin. It's to say this. When people look at us as those who claim Christ and they examine our lives, do they see at work, in our faults, in our shortcomings, in each area of our life, do they see the Holy Spirit at work in us and reflecting Jesus in those areas of growth? Because perfection doesn't come until the end. If your goal is to perform and be Jesus to others, we'll have counseling for you in a few months when you need it. This is just not going to happen but you can yield to the Spirit of God and the transforming work that that Spirit brings and let other people in and be vulnerable and let them see the stuff that's going on inside of you and see the Spirit of God working in you. I want to conclude with this. 
it doesn't escape me that of the things that we've talked about around the Holy Spirit, he is also the bringer of conviction, which a lot of us, if we're open with ourselves and hold the word of God up as a mirror in our life, have no problem identifying with. But he's also a comforter. And I think this is important in the area of disciple making as well. I want to read from Acts 9 and verse 31. So the church all throughout Judea and Galilee and Samaria enjoy peace being built up and going on in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit. And the church continued to increase. And being comforter is important as well. I was thinking about the last 18 months in my life. Here's the list. I lost a job. I lost a brother-in-law to cancer. I lost a grandchild to miscarriage. Lost another brother-in-law to suicide. Nearly lost my sister in December to internal bleeding. I currently have an aunt who flatlined twice this month and is not doing well. And I've heard stories of people in the church here that are experiencing the exact same things. Tremendous loss, tremendous trial. And it is only by the comfort of the Holy Spirit that we can go on. I've heard some of the things that have been said, that have been written, that have gone through emails. And I don't do Facebook anymore. The day I quit being a pastor, I quit Facebooking. It's not because I don't like you. I just don't like Facebook, so sue me. So I don't, I don't read those things much anymore. I don't... But... I, you know, Sherry was sharing with me some of the things that were going on around Ty's situation and around Doug's situation with his son-in-law. And there are so many people clinging on to the comfort of God in his word, trusting in the truth of his word and praying through it. And this comfort of the Holy Spirit is what brings us through. And we need to remember that God loves us and by his spirit, he ministers to us in those times. And when you or the person you're discipling are at their wit's end, when they are completely empty and they have nothing left to give, it's not the worst place to be in the world because we turn the only place that we can. At the foot of the cross to Jesus asking for that pouring of the Spirit to come on us and to bring us that comfort. Comfort is realized through receiving of the word and I think quietness and prayer and just sitting still through worship and service, we can be comforted by the Holy Spirit and know that it's going to be okay because our God is big and our God is good. And even in the saving of my sister and the death of my brother in laws, God is good in both situations. He is our comforter. So as you're discipling, do not neglect the Holy Spirit. Even if we disagree on the gifts that are for today, take the ones that you believe that are and pray that God would just use you in any way he sees fit with them. I think that's all we have for today. Let's pray. Father, you are good. And you've given us your spirit. Thank you, Jesus, for sending him. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for not leaving us alone, for being one who convicts, one who comforts, one who encourages, one who guides, one who instructs, one who empowers. Let us not neglect you in this process of disciple making. Let us not fear the false things that we've seen in the past and embrace the truth. Let us be a people who want to work and walk in the mission of Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. Don't forget, the sign-up sheets are out in the back by the Welcome Center for the Disciple Makers Handbook. And um, again, classes start on the 10th and the 12th. And if you've been through the class, this Wednesday starts the three-week uh, micro group. Thank you very much and have a great weekend.